Today is September 12, 2011. My name is Tony Hilliard and I am here with Ed Woods. We are volunteers here at the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, Georgia. With us today is Mr. Bob Wallace, a veteran of the Vietnam War who has agreed to share his experience with us uh, in Vietnam for the Library of Congress's Veterans History Project. Welcome, Bob. Would you please state your full name? Uh, my full name is Robert Ellis Wallace. And uh, your date of birth? Uh, date of birth is <clears throat> June the 5th, 1943. Can you tell us a little bit about your life growing up? Um, I was born in a uh, small town in, um, in Tennessee. And um, uh, my mom was a homemaker and uh, my dad was a, uh, a farmer in the uh, county agent and an edu educator. And um, I'm the eldest of... Um, five, uh, three brothers <clears throat> and a sister. Um, we were initially raised in a, in a log cabin, which was that my grandfather owned near a, near a small lake. And then we moved into a town of like 500 people when I was like 12 years old. And, um, I went to school, um, at, um, uh, Allert, Tennessee Elementary School and to, uh, Sergeant Elvin C. York uh, Institute in Jamestown, Tennessee. And um, uh, my life growing up was pretty much like anyone else in a, in a small town. We would uh, uh, we'd go hiking and we'd, we'd play um, uh, games and, um, and the church was right next door to the house. And uh, we... Um, we would babysit my grandmother for um, a dollar a night when we were growing up. And um, it was just pretty much small town America. Okay. Uh, did you enter the service from that small town? Um, yes, I went to, um, <clears throat> I went to college at um, uh, Sewanee the University of the South. And um, I was in the ROTC program there. And I learned to fly in the ROTC program, and then I entered the Air Force um, after uh, the fall after I graduated in 1965. Okay. Um, when you, in 1965, were you aware of what was developing in the, in Southeast Asia at the time you got commissioned? I, I think we were all very much aware, okay. and we were all very much aware that um, that. Then of course we had the draft, um, and and some people were worried about deferments and things. But it seemed like I was going to go eventually, no matter what. And uh, and I really, to tell the truth, wanted to go. Okay. Did did you once you were commissioned? Did what what happened to you after you were commissioned? Where did you go after you got your bars? Um, I actually had to go to summer camp, uh, <clears throat> ROTC summer camp, the summer after I graduated, and then um, I received my commission then. And then I went to pilot training, undergraduate pilot training in uh, Del Rio, Texas, at Laughlin Air Force Base. And that course was 55 weeks. And um, we flew the um, T-41, which is the Cessna 172, the T-37, and the T-38. Did, uh, was that just basic airmanship? Right. It was. Flying? It was uh, just. Uh, it was the basic undergraduate uh, pilot training course, is what the Air Force called it. Okay. And then, then after that course, you received your your Air Force wings. And then the Air Force tradition is to take the first set of wings that you get and break them in half and never wear. Them. Is, is there a reason for that? I, I don't know what the reason is, but it's, it's Air Force tradition. Okay. And uh, this good friend of mine, couldn't he couldn't attend the graduation because his brother-in-law had been killed in Vietnam in a helicopter crash, and he asked me to get his wings and, and break them in half, so that's I did that for him, too. Okay. So what, what happened next? Where did you go from there? Uh, after that, I went to, um, seemed like every survival school the Air Force had. And the first one was in um, uh, 
Homestead Air Force Base near Miami, Sea Survival School, and we would um, we would parasail into the water and deploy our life rafts, and we had some um, some shrimp and some fishing lines, and we put the right life raft together and started fishing out in the bay out there. So this was in the event that you you had to ditch at sea or right, something. Right. Yeah. Okay. We, and then the, um, the the next course was um, uh, it was a radar um, uh, navigation school at uh, Davis Monthan Air Force Base in Tucson, Arizona, and um, we um, it was kind of beneath our dignity as pilots to be to be radar navigators, but the Air Force wanted two pilots in the um, in the F-4, and that was that was what that was our assignment. So anyhow, we'd be in a simulator in the. Um, the um, navigators were instructing us in the simulator, and so we take turn about flying the simulator. One one pilot would fly the front seat, and another pilot would fly the, the back seat. And after a while, we learned that that the pilot in the front seat could go to sleep, and the pilot in the back seat could disguise his voice and change commands and, and fly the airplane, and run the radar at the same time. Okay. How long? How long were we there? Um. Probably about three months, I think. Okay. And then we went to um, another survival school in um, Spokane, Washington, at uh, Fairchild Air Force Base, and we learned escape and evasion. And uh, we had a simulated prison camp, and we were stuck out in the um, in the woods in the snow with um, uh, nothing to eat for three days but a rabbit that we had to kill ourselves. So you brought the rabbit? Uh, they, they furnished it, yeah. Okay. And uh, the guy that was with me got dehydrated and, and wouldn't eat snow, and they had to put him in the hospital. And he had to go back through the course. And then after that, went to, um, to uh, California, to uh, George Air Force Base for F-4 training. And that course was about, oh, probably about six months, I would think. And that was a that was a good assignment. It was up in the high desert, and um, we um, we were always the junior guys in the squadron, and we'd fly at night, and um, and then we we'd come back in about I don't know five in the morning or so, and nothing on base was open to get a bite to eat except the um, except the airmen's mess, and we'd go by there and, and have breakfast. And then we'd go up in the mountains and trout fish all day and then come back and sleep all afternoon and do the same thing again. And our wives hated us. Was this a training squadron you were in? Uh, yeah, it was a training squadron. Okay. And I, I can't remember the designation. I think it was a... I, I can't remember what it was now. It was the Blue Knights, but I can't remember the, the you designation. You were married during all this? Yes, I was married during all that. So did, with did, one daughter. Did you, did you marry... I married in college, yeah. Okay. Married in college. Okay. And then we, in, in this assignment, we, um, for a while, we lived in um, Apple Valley behind Roy Rogers' uh, ranch out there. And uh, then later on, we moved on base. And, um, which was which was really a nice deal to be able to live on base as a first lieutenant. <laughs> so, is this now the 1966, 67 time frame? Yeah, this was in, the, in 67, yeah. Okay. Yeah, this was getting us up to 67. And we had one loss in the squadron. Um, a guy, um, we were, he was out practicing or something, I don't know what he was doing, but he, he'd flown the F-4 like the year before at Cameron Bay and was coming back for another tour. And um, he rolled in on something out in the desert and, and never pulled, pulled out. and. So we had our first, you know, first loss before we even got to the war. So kind of made an impression on all of us there. At, at this point, you probably knew you were going to Vietnam. We, we, our squadron commander said, he said, I want all volunteers in the squadron for Vietnam. So, I, so this my aircraft commander, the guy I was screwed up with, who'd had a tour before it, Cameron Bay also. He said, this volunteer to go to Yuban, he said, that's where they killed the Migs. I said, 
we might as well as if we're going anyhow. So, so that's what we did, and it was it was a choice assignment, and we got to go together, which which was good, and um, so that that worked out pretty well. So you were you were actually a designated air crew. Right. Okay. Yeah, we were we were crewed together, and they kept us together too. Not, they didn't always do that, but they did in this particular time. Did so. When did you depart? We left in I think it was like September of '67, uh, and then on the way over we went to the uh, Jungle Survival School at uh, Clark Air Force Base in the Philippines. D did you go over with an airplane or on an airplane? No, we flew commercial over there. Okay. Yeah, we didn't. We didn't take the airplanes over. So you did you did you go? You flew into Thailand, and then we actually flew into um, into Clark first, and went to the survival school, and then we flew from Clark to Bangkok. Military air? Uh, no, it was it was a commercial carrier. Okay. I, I don't. I can't remember if it was Continental or 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 World or who it was. I can't remember who it was now. What What was your First impression arriving in uh, in Thailand. That the smells <laughs> and the, you know the same with the Philippines. I mean, it was just the smells would just knock you over. Just like you know, the, like squid and fish on the street and diesel fumes and and the heat and humidity and and the hustle and bustle of everything. Well, let me let me take one step back. You you did uh, seer school uh, escape. Right in the Philippines, what was that like? It was, it was kind of fun, really. I mean, <laughs> we uh, we were over there, and we uh, they set us out, and they had this uh, Filipino Negrito who was supposed to go, supposed to capture us. If he captured us, he got extra money or something. So I I went and uh, and first of all, we had to sleep out in the in hammocks in the jungle, and. Sugarcane rats would crawl all over the hammock. I remember that. And um, and then the next day we we had to escape and evade from the, the Filipino Negrito, and he and so I went back up in a um, in a bamboo cane break there, and I pulled them all back in behind me, and it, and he never found, he never found me. He came through the chopper with a machete, but he never found me. So so I felt like I at least pulled one over on him. So. So it was kind of fun. So when you arrived in in Thailand, what uh, what what did you do? I mean, we uh, we stayed in a hotel I think the first night in um, in um, in Bangkok, and then the next day we took a uh, C-130 up to um, up to our base up at Yuban, Thailand, up in northern northeastern Thailand. And as I on the C-130, there was a um, a Thai Air Force officer on there. And uh, he and I were talking on the um, on the airplane and everything, and then and then later on I, I ran into him at the at the officers club and introduced myself again and talked to him again and uh, come to find out he was in charge of the motor pool and he said if you ever need a jeep or anything he said just just let me know you know and I said well I can't ask you to do that and he said no it's no problem just let me know and then later on he um, he was a graduate of a um, a local university I don't know exactly where it was but they were. They were having an alumni party, and he asked um, my aircraft commander and I to come to his alumni party. Was well, you were assigned to a squadron? Yeah, I was assigned to the uh, 433rd Tactical Fighter Squadron, and they flew F-4Ds, and the D was like the F F-4C, except it had some advanced uh, navigation and some advanced systems on it. In fact, our, our airplane had uh, had the same. Uh, radar, radar nose as a as a C did because we had some had had some uh, infrared sensors on it. Did you have a, a break in period or a training period in country or in the squadron upon arriving? Um. Well, sort of, but <laughs> we uh, usually they would try to assign you to a to a low threat area like over in what we called Route Pack 1, which was just north of the DMZ. And usually you do that for like, say, five missions or so. And then after five missions, you would be going what we call downtown, which is up near Hanoi and Route Pack 6 and Route Pack, up around Route Pack 5 sometimes. And, and then 
the, the stand, standing joke was that how do you get to go to Route Pack 6? And the, and, the, uh, and the answer was, well, you can't get there from here. First of all, you couldn't go unless you'd been there. And the way you got to go there was we had, we had uh, five airplanes. And the runway was so narrow that, that uh, number one and number two would, would roll down the, down the runway. And then number three would roll. And as soon as number three would roll, number five would pull into number three spot and be running his engines up. And, and four, four would roll. <clears throat> and then five would roll. Then they'd all join up together. And then if one of those airplanes broke for some reason, then number five would take their spot, and that's how you got to go to Route Pack 6 the first time. You went as a spare, the air spare. Okay. And uh, a lot of times these flights were, um, Colonel Robin Olds was the um, wing commander when I was over there, he had, and Colonel Chappie James was the vice commander, and they called themselves Black Man and Robin. And it was just a great operation. I mean, I mean morale was just tremendous. And uh, Colonel Olds always led the, the flights off, and he'd take off in one airplane, and he'd take off, then they'd roll five airplanes, and they'd roll five more airplanes, and roll five more airplanes, and then roll five more airplanes, or 20 airplanes. They'd all join up, and he'd fly, fly, take the whole 20 ship real low over the revetments, and the crew chiefs would stand up and cheer, and then he'd be about out of gas by that time, and have to hit the tanker right over the base. So most of the time the mission started off like that if they were going to be a big mission. So how far, I guess, from the, the border of Vietnam were you? We were about, um, I think, a couple hundred miles. I'd have, okay. to, have to look at but I think about a couple hundred miles probably from the Lay Ocean border. So probably, um, probably three or four hundred from the Viet, depending on what part okay. of Vietnam you're going into. And probably... 500 miles from um, from uh, Hanoi or something like that. I, I think it's about the right distance. And we'd be we'd be topping off with a tanker most all the time on the way in, and the and the tanker coming back out also. Okay, the F4 ate a lot of fuel. Yeah, it ate a lot of fuel, and we we ran it pretty fast. And we part of the time we'd be flying uh, mid cap combat air patrol and. Um, We'd be clean with maybe just a gun on the center line and, and uh, tanks, tip tanks, or wing tanks. And then sometimes we'd be carrying iron, carrying iron bombs, and that they were pretty high drag. So we'd, we varied the mission. One day we'd do one thing, another day we'd do another thing. And we had this one guy over there, he's, he, uh, we would always split the refuelings. We'd try to split as much, much flying as we could, and. Uh, it was we called the back seat of the F4 the cave because it was everything was was really kind of jammed up back there and there wasn't much room and and we knew we were in trouble back there when they took the, uh, the standby compass the whiskey compass and moved it down below the down by the right rudder pedal so we could hardly see it but we were uh, we were good about splitting things we'd split we we never engaged the autopilot we'd always just tra trade. Um, control positions with each other. And we'd split the refuelings too. The um, aircraft commander would take the first refueling, the, the inbound refueling, and the, the, um, the co-pilot or the um, weapon system officer would take the, the uh, post-strike refueling. Can you describe that refueling process? I mean, I think a lot of people have seen the TV pictures of that, but I mean, what's that like? <laughs> it's like? It's like flying formation on the Empire State Building. <laughs> It's uh, it's really a, um, it's it's just a process, and, and there's there's lead-in lights underneath the airplane to lead you into it, and then the boom has uh, has marks on it which are red, orange, and green, and then what we do is we came in on the boom, the boom be sticking down like this, and we as we came in we take the center mirror and flip it up like this so we can in the refueling port was behind her head. So we, as we came in, we'd flip the center mirror up so we could see the, see the boom in the mirror. And as we came in, the boomers were so good, they just stabbed us on the way in. And the F-4 had a problem with breaking, breaking off the booms. So we had, to, we had a circuit breaker back there. If it, if it grabbed the boom and started to break it off, we'd have to pull the circuit breaker and disengage it. Um, but then 
we really didn't use the lee-in lights. After a while, there was a like a line of rivets under the airplane, and we'd line the canopy bolt with the, with the rivets. And and when I started flying aircraft commander, they said, now if you start getting heavy on the boom, just just take the throttle and, and put it in afterburner. Well, and then and modulate it. Well, I thought they were talking about the one in afterburner. <laughs> so I'm sitting on the boom moving the one in afterburner. They meant put, stick one in afterburner and take the other throttle and, and move it in, in military power. But the F4 had such a soft light, it didn't make any difference. It just stayed on it. So, but after, it's one of those things. After you did it for a while, you you could just just get right with it and. Uh, you know, the boomers start to say something to you and, and we'd say maintain radio silence and and the and the good boomers were just they were they were just top notch. They just hit you on the way in every time. And then the tanker guys would always want to know what frequency you were going to be on, what the strike frequency was. And so we'd say, Do you know the tail number method? And they say, What's that? And we said, You know your tail number? And he said, Yeah. And he said, Okay, take the first number and subtract two and take the next number and subtract three and all that, then you give it to him that way, and then he he'd announce it in the open. <laughs> so you're trying to get him. <laughs> we're trying to, to, yeah, we're inbound. We're inbound, you know. Of course, they had our they had our frag order every time we went in. You know, we should have known, but we were trying to be a little bit discreet about it. But they uh, the tanker operators were great. They take it. They take it as far north as they could. They take us. They take it into Laos. And sometimes they they even take into North Vietnam and coming back out if you're. You were hurting for gas. They they crossed the North Vietnamese border to pick you up too. I mean they were they were great. Did you want to show any of those? Yeah, we can show this. Sure. Okay, we uh, we carried a a map. Okay, go ahead. Okay, inbound to the target. Uh, we we had maps we made each morning in intelligence, and the map was that uh, we take the. Uh, Hanoi, and it was called Bullseye, and we put in the coordinates for Hanoi into our inertial navigation system, and then we'd reference, everything was referenced off Bullseye, which was the center of Hanoi, and all the, uh, the big eye, the, um, the, uh, the radar um, airplanes, EC-121s, and uh, the airplanes up in the sky would, would reference everything off Bullseye from where the, where the MiGs were, and so we carried this map, and it has ranges on it, and so everything would be a range and a bearing off bullseye. And then there, there are small orange numbers you can see on there. And the small orange numbers were the uh, active SAM sites for that day that intelligence gave us. And they talk about which ones were active, which ones were tracking. And so we'd know in generally where they were coming from. And we could reference those with our uh, radar homing and warning gear as, to, as far as which site was which. And then we could also report that back to intelligence when we came back. So we made a, a fresh bullseye map every day. Okay. For every mission. Okay. Um, did you want to? Yeah, oh, well, these are just some um, some pictures here, and um, and uh, one one picture is um, is is it's one of me and in, in, um, in front of the airplane. It seemed like we were we were getting our picture made about uh, every other day or something sometimes. And this is a standard Air Force. Uh, photo and this is the one they sent home and so this this one and then we also had uh, we, some squadron photos and, and uh, here are some of those and uh, where you can see those or not and there's probably a, a lot of guys we, we had those made out on the flight line and then here's a here's another one you can see too and the uh, some some of the times some things we do on the uh, on the flight line sometimes we uh, when we weren't weren't flying, we'd uh, we'd be um, be standing down for some reason due to weather or or something. So we'd be out out um, around the airplanes. And uh, one day we were out there, and there were some um, some MJ4 bomb loaders out there. And uh, so we we started drag racing them out on the flight line. And the chief of maintenance came out there and and stopped the old crusty weapon sergeant. He said, said Sergeant, what are those pilots doing driving those bomb loaders? He says. Begging the colonel's pardon, sir. Said thought they might get stuck out somewhere, sir. Said give them a little OJT how to upload their own bombs, sir. <laughs> so uh, and then we we uh, before every mission we uh, we take the bullseye map and we uh, we usually show the crew chief where we were going and what we we're going to hit and and uh, so if if we could we would unless it was really a, really a hush hush mission. If not, we'd tell him as soon as we came back. 
and when I checked out as aircraft commander and I was uh, still a lieutenant, we'd go out to the airplane myself and, um, and um, another lieutenant and a crew chief would say, oh no, not two lieutenants flying my airplane today, oh no. Tell it, the crew chief was a pretty integral part of oh, your, yeah. your team. Can you talk just a little bit about oh, yeah, they, its responsibility? They were great. They, they were the best. I mean, and they just, and you know, they took such pride in their airplane. I mean, they just, and, and you know, and, and you just, you know, you, you, did, you didn't want to hurt his airplane because you, you knew he'd be hurt if you hurt his airplane. So, so we always tried to take, you know, as excellent care of the airplane and, and we tell him what a good airplane it was and what it did and, and all that and yeah they were just they were, they were top notch guys and um, I remember I remember one time we and you got to know them pretty you got to know them pretty well in fact one one night I was leaving the Airman's Club and these and these two two airmen were there and one one bumped into the other one they started to swing at each other and I said wait a minute wait a minute I, said, I know you you work on down so and so in the phase dock and said I know you you work so and so and so and so and I said, he said, I said, we can't have you guys doing this. We can't have you, you can't be doing this. <laughs> and so I asked one guy, I said, where are you going? He said, well, I'm going to the club. I said, well, why don't you go in the club? I said, the other guy, I said, where are you going? He said, I'm going to barracks. I said, no, no, no. I said, you put me on the bus and make sure I get downtown. So we go to the front gate and he starts to get off the bus. And I said, wait a minute, where are you going? I said, you got to make sure I get downtown tonight. And he said, sir, he said, said E3s can't go off base after midnight. <laughs> I said, "Oh, okay, that's all right. Go ahead." <laughs> so we we had uh, they were just was it were, a close knit group? Oh, yeah. were they what? They were a close knit group. They were, yeah, and uh, they were in um, um, and and the the um, and the weapons guys were great too. I mean, you know, they were the people that armed you in the in the in the, in the dearming area, and you you always made sure you had your held your hands up clear so that you didn't touch any switches while they were. While they were down there under the airplanes, because it was kind of, kind of dangerous, and, and a lot of times we did what was called hot refueling too, where we we refuel with all the engines running too at the same time. So we, um, they, you, you just you didn't worry about your airplane. You knew your airplane was in top-notch shape all the time. Well, tell us a little bit about your missions and, and how, what that was like, <laughs> we and had, anything uh, that stands out. Yeah, we had we had. Uh, Couple three different missions. We had uh, we had a mission where we we fly over and do uh, uh, route recce over in, in the lower packages of, of North Vietnam, and we sometimes we wouldn't have a target. We would just fly up and down roads and look for trucks and, and things like that, and we do that both daylight and dark. And but we had another squadron that was just dedicated to flying at night, although we'd fly at night sometimes. And um, I remember flying one night and. Uh, the, I was flying as aircraft commander, and, and the fellow that I'd been crewed up with, uh, Rick Bennett, was was the flight lead, and and uh, we both had flares on the airplane, and uh, there's a little bit of moon out that night, and and so so I went in and went down the down this river, dropping the flares about every I don't know um, quarter mile or so, and then pulled up, and then we saw these trucks running for cover. And uh, he rolled in on some, and then, and uh, we we had one that was stuck down in uh, like a ravine or something. It couldn't get out of it. And we we had uh, CBUs on board, which for the clamshell kind, which burst open and the CBUs uh, come out. So CBU is a cluster bomb. Yeah, right? cluster bomb unit. So we uh, so we kept trying to get get the truck with the CBUs and. Uh, we uh, we circled him with a ring of him and set off a barrel of gasoline, and then we knew where he was the whole time. So then we kept kept working him over and finally got him. But uh, it was a we do that at night some, and then sometimes we carried some missions where we uh, flew almost um, into Haiphong and we catch a jet stream and uh, uh, threw out some bombs and some close, some bombs that would split open the same way a CBU would, like a clamshell. And put propaganda leaflets out. We did that sometimes. Uh, the primary mission was either flying strike on the on the heavy targets in North Vietnam, uh, thermal power plants, uh, uh, bridges, um, storage POL, petroleum oil lubricants uh, storage areas, and um, up around um, Hanoi and, and Haiphong, 
and airfields too. We did some airfield interdiction. And then sometimes we'd fly a, a MIGCAP, Combat Air Patrol, uh, while we were on, on alternate days too. And um, then when we'd have a, a um, stand down or, or a truce, we'd go to targets in, in Laos pretty much. And, and, um, and there was a lot of a lot of stuff moving through Laos at that time too. And we had another mission called Combat Sky Spot, which uses a beacon, um, just like a transponder or a radar beacon, and, and then the ground controller calls your drop. And we did a lot of those in, in Laos too, in some some areas that weren't too heavily defended in North Vietnam. You were you were there for Tet of sixty eight. Yes, uh, yes, I was. Yeah, we supported Tet and. Um, we, we were doing uh, combat sky spots all around Tet, and it was so cloudy during all that that we couldn't really get underneath it to work. So, we, so your, your roles during that were close air or, or targets? It, it or? wasn't really close air. It was mostly trying to, trying to um, I think, bomb the hills around there and everything, and we couldn't get close enough. We, uh, the troops, so close to the troops that we couldn't get underneath the clouds to work. So we. We we're doing uh, combat sky spots on the. Um, Could on you the explain what that means? A combat. It's it's the one that where you have the radar beacon, and the radar beacon is really taken from a, a B-52 um, a practice scoring range when they practice their their bomb drops. But they they put them on our airplanes, and a ground controller tracks you, and then he calls you drop, and they they feed in the computer the uh, the uh, ballistics of the bombs, and, okay. and they know your speed, and they know the wind drift, and and he'd stabilize your wind drift. He'd, he'd give you small corrections right at the last minute, and he'd say, "On my mark, ready, 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 mark, mark," and then he, you'd drop the bombs. And we had a problem with that, and that some of the bombs we were dropping had uh, delayed magnetic fuses on them. And uh, sometimes guys would drop the bombs, and they'd look out, and they'd see their wingman just vaporize as the bombs went off underneath them. So we didn't really like to drop those that way that much. Because you were depending on somebody else. I mean, you had no vision. Well, no, just because of the, the arming of the bombs. Right? Okay. It wasn't stable. Okay. Yeah. Not not so much uh, the other person. I'm sure they're very accurate, but uh, but uh, it just the, the bombs would because they had the magnetic fuse. It would it it'd blow itself up sometimes, and um, you know you'd look out and the other guy just vaporizes as the bombs went off. So a lot of guys dropped them safe. I mean, I, I don't think I ever dropped them safe, but a lot of guys just dropped them safe. You you mentioned you know losing some people to that. What was what what was the the casualty rate or, or the capture rate or yeah. what, in the squadron or the squadrons? You were it's it's pretty hard to say. It used to be and was, and this was pretty much just like scuttlebutt that it, that you were going to get shot down once every twenty five missions and then you get picked up, um, you know one of those and. Uh, <laughs> And then you'd get sent home or something, and there's there's a lot of talk about it, but but uh, you didn't know, you really didn't know. And our our squadron uh, was very very fortunate. I don't I don't think we had any any combat losses until until oh towards the end of when I was over there, which was like uh, August of uh, 1968, and um, I had a real good friend, and he and I both had. Had upgraded to the um, to the front seat of the F4, and and we didn't have that organizer training program. We had, but it was the only one we had, so it was, it was the only shot we had to do it. And so they'd say, um, Lieutenant, said, see that airplane out on the flight line with those bombs on it? I'd say, Yes, sir. I said, Take them over to Laos and drop them. Part of your checkout. So anyhow, so we we did that, and he and I were um, I'd uh, wreck my motorbike and I'd separated my shoulder and I came home to the States for about three weeks and then I came back and, and he was kind of razzing me and he was saying, you know, we're in the intelligence briefing and he said, I've been killing a lot of trucks while you're gone. I got some really secret settings I've been killing these trucks with. And I said, well, you be careful now. I said, watch yourself. And, and so they took off in the two ship ahead of us and then, I don't know, about a few minutes later, 15 minutes later or something like that, we took off behind them. And it was really a, a black, black night. And uh, uh, next thing I heard was his, his flight lead calling for, saying he'd flown in the ground or gone in the ground or whatever. And, and we still don't know what happened to him. He's, he's, uh, 
I think he's resumed KIA now, but uh, and that that made a real difference to me that it all became very personal and it wasn't abstract. It was just when when and his name was John Cruz. He was from um, North Carolina, and when that happened, it just it just it just all became came very personal. When you when you were involved in night operations, I mean, um, other than flares, I mean, did. Were you using infrared, or how did you know what was going on outside the airplane? We just used the old Mark One motto eyeball. Usually, in fact, we were up there one night, and we were, and it, we knew it was about 500 feet overcast, and we were we were letting down over the water. We knew where the water was, so we were letting down over the water. And what our plan was to let down over the water and then run in on the beach and, and find some targets as soon as we hit the beach. So we kept letting down, letting down, and we we're talking to these Navy A6 guys. And A6 could do anything. He could do stuff the Air Force couldn't even do. So, so we're talking to these guys, and we said, "How's the weather down there, Navy?" And he said, uh, "You know, I said it's about 200 feet." He said, "Overcast." He said, "It's kind of rainy down here." So we're running up and down these passes and everything. He says, "Air Force says we don't think you ought to come down here." <laughs> we said, "No, we don't think we're going to come down there either." <laughs> so, so we did. So we, we went up and, and did something else. But uh, it it we. We did have some um, some technology that we had on on the F4. We had um, we had some radar bomb modes, and uh, what you could do is you could find a radar target, like a bright mountain peak or something like that, and take cursors and uh, just like you do on a computer, and lock onto that, and then you would have the distance to the target from that particular radar target, and then you would hit the uh, the pickle button, the bomb button on the airplane. And would feed that information into the computer, and then the bombs would fly straight and level over the on a on a track over the target, and the bombs would come off at a predetermined time. And that worked pretty well. It had a, it had a pretty good uh, circular um, error probability on the thing. Uh, then also we had a thing called uh, um, a radar bomb mode where we would lock onto the ground return, and then that would feed information into the computer. And then you would keep holding the pickle button down, and the, uh, the bombs would come off when they're supposed to. And, and all you had to do was keep the wings level and uh, fly over the target, and that would work also. And that, that worked pretty well. Most of the time, we would um, our, our tactics were like we would um, just make one pass. We didn't stay around for multiple passes because we were, we were used to working in the high threat area. And so we would always just. And it seemed like the times when, when we did make multiple passes, we always got we always got in trouble. And Sp speaking of high threats, I mean, you're talking about SAMs, right. uh, Sam service air missiles. Yeah. Did did you ever get fired at? Yeah, we had uh, <clears throat> we had quite a few SAMs um, at us, and we were coming in on the um, you know, target. Um, I think it was Fukiet Airfield. I can't remember. And we were number four in a, in a and a four ship of F4s, and there was a four ship of F105s in front of us. And we used to fly a formation called Pod Formation, which was uh, it was about a thousand feet or fifteen hundred feet apart, and then staggered a thousand or fifteen hundred feet, and then and then pretty much uh, line abreast. And then if you saw a SAM, what you would do is you would take the airplane and you you'd let the SAM come up like this, and then the SAM would start looking at you, and you'd start shoving the nose down like this, and then you'd see if the SAM was, was still looking at you, and it committed at you, and then you'd make the SAM go down, and the SAM had little bitty wings on it, so you could outturn the SAM, so you'd get it coming down, and, and it was a formation thing, and the, the lead called it, and he'd say, SAM at 3 o'clock, uh, so-and-so flight, take it down, and everybody start shoving forward on the stick and put negative Gs on the airplane, Dirt's coming up off the floor, and checklists are flying, and and then we also found out that under negative G's, the flight controls are reversed. The ailerons were reversed, so you'd be trying to bank away from a guy, and you'd really be going into him. So to get away from him, you had to bank into him, although the rudder worked the right way. So that took us. That was a little bit of a learning curve. So anyhow, then right at the last minute, when the Sam commits down to you like this, then he said he'll say, "Take it up." And you, you come back sharply on the stick, back up, and the SAM goes underneath you like this, and it stalls out over here, and it can't it can't hack the turn. So we we did that quite a bit. Anyhow, on this one particular mission, uh, I think 
this 105 driver didn't see the Sam. He's, he's up there. He's silhouetted. He's like, and if it hadn't hit him, it would hit us. And it just, he's up there. And about the time the, the, um, the mission lead, which was composed of F4s and F105s, called Take It Down. And he's kind of silhouetted up there. And, and, the, and then our, our flight lead, we're getting ready to bomb, so we have to uh, echelon, which means everybody's on the same side of the lead. And so he dipped his wing like that for us to echelon, and about that time, Sam hits, hits the F-105 in the left wing route, and he just goes in like that, like a crippled duck right in front of us. So, so we came back, and, and we're debriefing, and, and uh, uh, Major Bill Kirk, who's later on, General Bill Kirk was the flight lead, who he later on became the uh, commander of, of uh, Air Force in, in Europe, he said, he said, well, that's one way to get away from a Sam. said, duck under your leader. <laughs> so we said, well, you gave the signal. He said, yeah. How long a period did that take? I mean, what what, what are you talking about? How many seconds, minutes, whatever you're talking about with the Sam? Oh, it's less than, say, 10, 15 seconds, I'd say. Okay. It's hard to say. I mean, it's, it all depends on where it is. But the one you see, you could avoid. It's the one you didn't see. And if you're flying above a, you know, an undercast, it could pop right up through the undercast and get you. But the F-105 drivers were, they were heroes. They were going in on the SAM sites. They were the first ones in and the last ones out. And they were, the, they were in, you know, every time they tried to get them to shoot and then they'd shoot them. At what speeds were you traveling? Uh, roughly um, about uh, five, six hundred miles an hour, something like that. Um, it, Kind of all depend. It was uh, there's this story going around about this 105 driver and he's executing the target and, uh, and his buddy's talking to him. They talk to each other a lot. He says, "Where are you, Jim?" He said, "I'm I'm up here. I'm crossing the Red River." And he said, "Okay, I'm coming up. You know, I don't see you." And then he asked him again, "Said where are you now?" He said, "I'm crossing the Black River." He said, "I'm coming up behind you, but I don't see you anywhere." So he asked him again. Where are you now? He said, I'm almost at the ocean border. And he said, Jim, he said, how fast are you going? He said, a thousand miles an hour. <laughs> but usually we'd fly about, about 600 or something like that. 500, 600, it depends on what, usually maybe a little slower going in, a little faster coming out. Did you ever have any experiences with MiGs? Yeah, we, uh, we had some come up and um, and we, when we fly cap, they come up and we try to, uh, we, we had a misunderstanding to start with with the, with the F-105. We were supposed to protect them because if they could make it into the target with their bombs, they could, they could finish the mission. And then they were fast enough to outrun the MiG on the way out. They were just coming in, they were so heavily laden they couldn't turn and maneuver with the MiGs. So we, they'd be calling the, uh, the MiGs out to us and what we do, we'd be like outriggers on the F-105s, and we'd break off into the MiGs because they were up, um, up pretty high around, I don't know, 35, 40,000 feet or so, and, and uh, flying a, a three ship, it's East German formation, and then they, they, they just go right through the strike force and fire off some heat-seeking missiles and just break, break for home is what they do before anyone could catch them. So what we would do is we, as soon as we knew where they were, as soon as they started. Before they even started turning in, we'd turn into them. And the, the 105 drivers would get a little anxious about that. They, they thought we were deserting them. And, and then we, after we got them educated as, as far as what we were doing, they were okay with it and it started working pretty well. And that was like uh, when I first got over there. But things were starting to work pretty well with them. If, what, what, was there a memorable mission or experience? Or something like uh, we had... Uh, well, we had one, um, and it was really supposed to be a low threat area. It was around uh, Chapone and, uh, and Laos, which was a, a storage and a transit area. And we were, I was, uh, I, I was just checking out as, uh, as a, uh, a night, night checkout for me, and it was just about dusky dark. And, uh, and I think this, uh, the flight lead was Lieutenant Colonel. He was getting his, his lead checkout. And, uh, so we uh, we called for a target, and they they assigned it. They said, "Do you, do you want this target? It's uh, so many gun positions, active tracking, and and uh, 
And all the old guys over there told me was never get in a contest with you against a gun. Said you said you're going to lose every time. Anyhow, the flight lead said he wanted the target, so uh, so we went in and uh, and so so I said uh, so he had I forget I think he had uh, cluster bomb units on board and and so so he's so he was going to go in first and uh, and uh, kind of get their heads down. And then I was going to go in with uh, with some iron bombs, and um, so he rolled in first, and and uh, we're as he's going down the chute, we're talking, we're saying, "Oh, look at that! Oh, they're really shooting him up! Look at that!" And then then it's about it's about time for us to us to go in, so we so we roll in, and uh, and it's just like you take a take a water hose and the the tracers. Just swung to us, off him, uh, off him to us. So we're pressing and pressing and 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 pop the bombs in. And I, and I so then we pull off target to rejoin with him. I, I looked down. I said, "Oh, I said that's really great." I said, "You put the, the cluster bombs, the CBUs, right on top of them." He said, "No." He said, "I'm off dry." He said, "Those are muzzle flashes." Those are what? Muzzle flashes. Oh. It was the guns going off. So I said, "Oh, it's going to be a long day." So so. I said, I said, I've got another idea. I said, I said, I said, why don't I go in first this time and you and you cover me? <laughs> so, so I rolled in with a pot of rockets and, and drilled a pot of rockets into them and, and popped off and then and, and then he's in behind me and they're they're still shooting him up pretty good. And I said, I said, I said to myself, I said, this just didn't work too good. I said, why don't uh, why don't I roll in from the uh, from the east and I'm off south and you roll in from the west and you're off north, you know, and that way we'll roll in at the same time and, and that way they, they can't get but one of us. You know, they can't get us both anyhow. So we did that in the last pass and it worked out pretty good. And um, I don't remember how many we damaged four gun positions or I don't I don't remember what it was, but anyhow we came back to intelligence debriefing and we're sitting in there and, and they and they uh, they'd already called in the bomb damage assessment and and the, the intelligence guy, he's all wrapped up about it. And he said, oh, yeah, we got all this stuff. Up. Yeah, tell us about it. And the, the lieutenant colonel's talking about, oh, yeah, we did this. And, oh, yeah, we did that. And I'm sitting over in the corner nursing a beer. We always had beer and intelligence. And so finally they turned to me and said, lieutenant, said, you got anything to add? And I said, yes, sir, I do. I said, that's the stupidest thing I've ever done. I'll never do it again. <laughs> There's been some songs written about Chipone. I think Chip Dockery's got one. I don't know who all else says. What was, did you fly every day or what was your mission we cycle We used to fly like? every day. Sometimes we'd, sometimes we'd fly twice a day. But we'd fly, we'd fly, usually fly every day. And usually we'd fly, we had, we had two strikes. We had like a morning strike and a, an afternoon strike. And, uh, and usually um, those were the big ones. And then throughout the day we have, uh, uh, route recce missions over in Laos and North Vietnam, but but usually the first mission would be a big goal like before daylight, and you'd you'd have breakfast and and uh, and then and go fly that, and and then come back, and you might you know sleep in the afternoon, but sometimes you'd do a quick turn, and you you might fly two a day, but usually just one a day, and it, and they usually lasted about about four hours. Your wife was. Uh, it, it, was she at a base or no? She was in. Uh, she was going to uh, college. She went back to college at UT. So she was at UT while all this was going on. Did uh, how did she feel about the business you were in? Well, she she didn't like it, like like anyone. And, and um, you know, I mean, and and they worry about you. They really do. And it's it's harder on them. I mean, I I really feel for these for the wives of, of servicemen these days. I mean, I, I know what they're going through. I mean, I, I know how hard it is for them. I mean, it's easy for you. You've got, you know, you're doing something. You're doing something you like. You're doing something you're good at. But it, it's hard on them. It really is. Did and the not knowing, too, is the hardest part. Did she have any difficulties on campus with, with people knowing that you were, you know, flying in, in the, the conflict? Oh, yeah, she did. She had trouble with some of her professors even. Uh, because they thought just because I was in Thailand that she should be able to go to Thailand and stay with me over there. And she kept trying to tell them I was flying over North Vietnam and that 
that really didn't register for, for them. And, and there was, and I'm sure there was some, um, maybe some other things too that went on, some anti-war stuff, but Tennessee's pretty conservative, so there wasn't too much of it, but I'm sure there was some of that too. Yeah, and you, you say you had a child. Yes, yeah, we had, I had a daughter. How old was she? She was about three. Okay. Is is uh, well when you came back? You came back in in uh, late September summer of, yeah. in September of, uh -huh. of sixty eight. How did how did that go? I mean, you came back to the states, and did you have any uh, experiences with any war protesters, or just in general? What was what was the reaction like when you came back? I, re I really didn't. I'd, I'd heard that. In fact, I had come home before and. Um, when I, I wrecked my motorbike and I came home for three weeks one time and, and I, I didn't experience, I hitchhiked home on Air Force airplanes. I, I really didn't experience anything then either. Um, I think my folks wanted it to be over with as, as far as that goes, which is normal. I, you know, I know my mom's not a religious person, but you know she prayed for me or else I wouldn't be here. Um, but I didn't really experience any you know, the so-called hatred or the spitting on people or anything, I, I just... Did you come back commercially or on military? We came back commercially. Okay. Um, I can't remember where we where we came into. Into San Francisco, I think. In uniform? Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So when you got back, what happened? What did you do? Well, started my downhill <laughs> slide in the Air Force. <laughs> I was assigned to, uh, I kept forecasting, we could, we could forecast to have a dream sheet where you want to go and what you want to do. So I said, well, I'd like to stay in the, F in the F4 and I'd like to go to Germany or Japan. Oh, no, you can't do that. I said, so they sent me to uh, Tendal Air Force Base in Panama City, Florida, to fly targets in a T-33. And that was just really beneath me, I thought. As it turned out, it was the best thing to happen to me in the world. I mean, because we got—I got a lot of flying time. I got 1,300 hours in two years, single, single-engine flying time, and uh, we could take the airplane on the weekend anywhere we want to go usually. And, and we had a great squadron. We had most of the guys were were Vietnam veterans coming back, and and uh, we had, and we were all young, and we just we had a, we had a great time. We really did in, in the squadron. We just one of our missions was flying air. Um, ROTC cadets around, we'd fly them around and, and uh, we'd, we'd say, and they were supposed to shadow us for a day, so we'd take them flying in the morning and we'd come back and we'd say, okay. And I said, you're supposed to do what a typical pilot does in a day, right? And I said, yes sir. I said, okay. I said, be up on the curb. I said, get your bathing suit on. We'd be by in about 15 minutes. So we came by with the boat, had the boat, iced down with beer and said, so we said, we can fly, we go fishing. <laughs> and this one guy says, Told you the Air Force is great. So I told you the Air Force is great. How, how long was you in country? Um, Eleven months. Eleven months. And and our our tour in, in country was, uh, we could if we once we got a hundred missions over North Vietnam, not over Laos or over South Vietnam, but over North Vietnam, we could go home. And I, since I upgraded to the front seat, the F four over there, I, that kind of extended me a little bit. I probably could have been home a little sooner, but I was over there about eleven months. But but your tour duty depending on depending on your number of flights or, or number of missions over number of missions yeah. or like one year whichever came first. How many missions did that include? About 150. 150 missions. Yeah. And um, and Air Force policy was nobody had to go to Vietnam twice until everybody had been once. So um, so. So when we were down at Timber, we'd, we'd do something maybe a little bit out of the way or something. We'd look at each other and say, what are they going to do, send me to Vietnam? And we said, no, I don't think so. <laughs> so did you stay in the Air Force? I, no, I stayed in for two more years. And, um, and I kept forecasting to, uh, to go back in the F-4. And they kept denying it. They told me if I kept my nose clean that I could have an F-106 to mine out North Dakota. And I said, no, I, I don't think so. And they had another deal. They said, would you guys like to fly the F-102? We said, sure, we'd like to fly the F-102. They said, okay. He said, uh, you can fly the F-102 and you'll get a, a new commitment to the Air Force. It'll extend you for five more years. 
And we said, no, we don't think we want to do that. We said, uh, why don't you just check us out locally so we don't get a commitment? I said, no, no, we can't do that. I said, well, uh, they said, we've got an approved school at this thing out in, in Texas. We said, okay. So we'll go to school and we'll take, uh, we'll take our leave time and go to school so we don't get a commitment. Oh, no, you can't do that. I said, okay. I said, why should I be a target at 43,000 feet when I can be one at 35? I said, no, I don't think I'll do that. So, so uh, it was looking like a dead end street. And so, I'd, and we'd had a dream sheet there, and I'd put, um, they would say, where do you want to go? And I'd say, I'd like to, I'd like to be assigned to the uh, embassy in, um, in Bolivia, and I, because they flew P-51s. <laughs> and they kept denying that too, so. <laughs> so it was, things just weren't gonna happen. So I'd had the best of everything, so it was just a good time to go. And um, in fact, when I got to the squadron, no one would speak to me until I put my papers in to get out because they were all getting out too. Most of the guys were. I mean, it didn't bother me. I was a regular officer and, and I was having a good time and, and I was going to see what it brought, but it just wasn't going anywhere. And I worked in the command post as an additional duty. That was one of the things I did. And, um, we, um, so then I got out of the Air Force and I, I worked as a management consultant um, in the um, uh, apparel industry for two years and doing like uh, industrial engineering work motion time study and uh, my degrees in economics so I was kind of working out of my field anyhow and then then I, and I meanwhile joined the reserve out of Dobbins and I flew the C7 caribou up at Dobbins in the reserve um, and then, um, then I got a job with Delta in 1972 and then I stayed with him ever since so so things have a way of working out for the best. I mean, you never know how they're going to work out. And I, I couldn't have predicted that, but they worked out well. And so I got to fly for 32 more years, so it worked out good. Did you retired from Delta? Yes. As, as a pilot? Yes. Did, uh, uh, what about your family? Is, uh, tell us a little bit about your, your family. And, uh, you still have one child? Or? We, have, we have two. We have two daughters. Um, one is uh, the older daughter, Lori. Is a, um, she's a teacher up in uh, Cherokee County. And, um, and I'm a fourth grade teacher. And my younger daughter, Stephanie, is a nurse practitioner up at uh, Kennestone Hospital. And uh, she's not married. My older daughter has uh, three children, okay. a boy and two girls. So, uh, so they, they've, um, they've turned out well. Okay. At, at, the, at the end of the interview, we ask you if, you know, this is free time. I mean, Whatever comment you would like to make for posterity, uh, uh, we'd like to hear it. You know about the war or, or whatever. I mean, it's your, it's your, you know. I think one of the things that that was, and it, it's really selfish to say this, but one of the things I really liked was just was like just living each day, and uh, I know when I got my Christmas presents. I opened them up as soon as I got them because I didn't think I'd be around to open them up. And, uh, and it's just like, I, mean, I know all that sounds like it's, it's all about me and everything, but, it, but uh, I mean, it's, it's not a bad way to live. I mean, you just live each day the fullest, and, and that's what you do. And um, it's, I, you know, I, I don't like the, you know, the bureaucracies and all those things. I, I still don't. So. But I, but I love the flying. I mean, the flying was great, and uh, and I, I love being able to, you know, to to, uh, to to fly the front seat of the F4, and we practice uh, tactics. We had an Australian squadron over, and we practice against them, and and they had F86 Sabers, which is a F86 with a Rolls Royce engine, which is a lot like a MiG-17. So that was that was good training. So. We just, it was, it was just a great time. It was just like, uh, it was just like being, you know, being in college every day or something, but it was for real. And you just, you know, you just have to know that, you know, things, you're going to, there are going to be losses and you, it, they're hard to, hard to accept those. Well, I, I want to thank, we really appreciate you coming and telling your story. It was an interesting story. It was a good story. And uh, I want to thank you for that, and thank you for your service. Well, thank you very much. I, I um, yeah, I, would, uh, I think, 
thing of it is, it's like Robert E. Lee said, you know, he said, it's a good thing that war is so horrific. Said, said if it weren't, we would grow too fond of it. True.